Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today's guest is Anil Seth. He's a leading researcher, writer, and public speaker on consciousness science, neuroscience, and artificial intelligence. And he's really good at communicating these new ideas at the very cutting edge of research in those areas, which are some of the things as biohackers and as people interested in controlling our own biology, things we really need to understand. He's a professor of cognitive and computational neuroscience at the University of Sussex and founding co-director of the Sackler Center for Consciousness Science. And he's working to understand the biological basis of consciousness by bringing together neuroscience, math, AI, computer science, psychology, philosophy, and psychiatry. Anytime you see someone bringing together a bunch of disparate fields like this around solving a problem, they always come up with new and interesting stuff, which is why biohacking got added to the dictionary, because same idea, bringing together these fields that didn't talk to each other. That is exactly why I wanted to have Anil on the show today. Anil, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Your TED Talk in 2017 about how your brain hallucinates your conscious reality went nuts and has 7.4 million views. Did you expect that when you went on stage at TED? Definitely not. When I went on stage, I was just worried about getting through it without forgetting what I was going to say and getting this whole terrifying experience behind me. Uh, I don't think anybody really expects their video to be viewed that many times. So it was definitely a surprise. Very pleasant one. I can tell you that uh, the video of me with this giant beard making Bulletproof Coffee has about 2 million views, and that took four years. So I got to say, you kicked my you kicked my butt there, and neither one of us today has a weird bushy beard. But what did you mean when you said, your brain hallucinates your conscious reality. The epic title, by the way, but what's what's the gist of that? Well, the title is funny because actually one thing I didn't know in advance, but the title of the TED Talk is about the only thing that you don't get to choose yourself. Uh, <laughs> so that wasn't my title. And it can be misunderstood because what one way people have misunderstood it uh, is that as something that we just make everything up, that there's no objective reality out there and that uh, everything is just the product of the mind. That's not what I'm saying at all. If you go and stand in front of a bus, you'll know it. It's not just a figment <laughs> of your imagination. And you know, a few people advised me to try that because they disagreed with what I was saying. I'm not saying that. What I mean is that it, it goes back to this old philosophical idea of the distinction between appearance and reality. Uh, so let's just assume there is a real world out there. I mean, that's really a question for physicists rather than for neuroscientists like me. We certainly perceive that there is a world out there and we perceive the things within that world to be real. So when I look outside of a window and I see blue sky or clouds, because I'm in England, uh, you know, these things seem to really exist, like the tree outside the window also seems to exist, seems to have a particular color. But then we know, for instance, colors, colors don't, exist as colors out there in the world. All that's out there in the world is electromagnetic radiation, various sorts, who knows what else. But there's certainly nothing that is actually red or green out there in the world. I mean, we've known this since Newton. The brain is inventing colors from combinations of wavelengths. So color is a sort of perceptual construction. And I think the same thing goes for everything that we perceive, not just colors, for all the attributes of the world that, that we experience around us, and critically, for how we experience ourselves, for the experience of being me or being you, that's also a construction. Now, the reason we use the word hallucination is because people typically think of hallucination as something very different from normal perception, that if you have a hallucination, you're really perceiving something that isn't there. The point I'm trying to make, and, and I'm sure we'll get onto this in, in more, more detail, is that there's really the same process going on. The same things in your brain are happening when you're having a hallucination, you know, you're perceiving something that other people don't, as when you're engaged in normal perception. It's just some aspect of the balance has changed. There's some pretty clear neuroscience evidence that the brain is a really good... Uh, 
pattern matching system and pattern filtering system. So there's multiple layers of the prefrontal cortex and they filter out stuff that you expect to be there that is there. So you don't have to pay any attention to it, but you don't really perceive it. The famous study with you know the gorilla in the middle of the basketball court that people don't see, et cetera, et cetera. So that would make sense there because we're filtering out a bunch of stuff that is in reality that we don't perceive and then therefore selectively choosing to perceive some things, not others. Is that accurate? I think that's half right. Okay. And it's very tempting to think of this idea of filtering out, that there's this hugely rich world of stuff out there. And you know, we know that we can only attend to one part of that hugely rich environment. In fact, when we think about vision, again, one of the most striking things about vision is that when we open our eyes, we seem to have this experience of a rich, and detailed and colored world that completely surrounds us. But we know that we only have high resolution vision and a very small part of our visual field. And color vision is also quite constrained to certain parts of the visual field. So this idea of filtering seems natural. But where I think it's not quite correct is it still assumes that perception and vision and whatever modality is a process that sort of comes from the outside in, that there's this real world that's got all this stuff and that we just select among that stuff some subset and that's what we perceive. What I think is wrong about that is that perception doesn't come from the outside in. It really goes the other direction. It comes from the inside out. So again, back to this simple example of colors, colors aren't there in the real world in the first place. The brain is projecting colors into our perception as a way of interpreting what's happening in the world. So it's not really a question of filtering out some stuff and leaving the rest. Certainly the brain is selective about what signals it responds to in the world. But what ends up populating our conscious experiences, what ends up forming our perceptions is not simply a process of selection. It's okay. an active process of construction. So something makes it through our filter and then our brain gives it a look, a feel, a taste. And, and we know this to be true because of things like synesthesia, the people who can you know, smell a color or taste a sound and things like that. So it is possible for something to be perceived differently by two people or the tetrachromats. People can see more color spectrum than others. It, it, they're both seeing the same thing, but one says that's a different shade of orange than the other. The other swears it's not. And they're both right from their perception. That's absolutely right. And I think this is actually one of the most important implications of this way of thinking, because yeah, indeed, synesthetes, tetrachromats, good examples of people who, when faced with the same objective world out there, will have different experiences. And there's also famous examples in you know, the effect of language, for instance, that certain cultures, Russian, I, I believe, will have be able to distinguish perceptually more shades of blue than non-Russian speakers. Uh, Whoa! Language carves up the, the the sensory world in into more bits, if you like. So, the, the the biggest message from all this is that we likely all see the world differently, uh, but that somehow, and of course, communication in society depends on, to some extent, ignoring those differences, assuming they don't exist, and agreeing on some sort of consensus interpretation, so that when we both point at uh, a red mug, we both agree, well, that's a red mug. Even though we might be having slightly different experiences when we look at that red mug. What's the useful implication of this? So you and I are sitting here, we may be looking at the same electromagnetic smog. Uh, I'm experiencing it as espresso with uh, brain octane in it, and you're experiencing it entirely differently. Uh, you know, you're, you're doing your own thing, but how does this impact what I'm going to do all day, the way I interact with you? Uh, like, I, I'm not sure that there's a so what here. Is there? Well, th there is. I mean, let, I have to be, I have to front up and say, for, from my point of view, I've just been interested in this because of the nature of the question. You know, how we come to experience the world and the self is just like, I mean, it doesn't, there doesn't have to be a so what. I mean, it's just fascinating, right? I mean, how am, who am I and how do, how do I perceive the world in the way that I do? Just fundamental questions. But there are implications as well. Uh, and these implications 
really do arise from the fact or the implication that each of us can perceive the world differently from each other and that we can ourselves perceive the world differently at different times of our lives. And we, we also notice through, for instance, uh, mental illness and psychiatry. So a lot of the symptoms of mental illness and uh, certain psychiatric syndromes, conditions, are expressed through changes in perception. We perceive the world differently or we perceive ourselves differently. And so understanding how these perceptions are constructed by the brain and the body gives us a route to understanding what's happening in these psychiatric conditions and then coming up potentially with diagnosis and treatments. But there's also the, the positive side, which is that you now we can train ourselves maybe to perceive the world differently than we do now, to optimize our perceptions perhaps. And also in recognizing that we do perceive the world differently from each other, I think it opens a space for cultivating a greater understanding in situations where people disagree about stuff. I mean, it's, uh, I've been, I live in England and for the last three years, there's been this incredible debate about whether we should remain part of the EU or not. And I think this is a good example of the most like socially contextualized uh, extension of what I'm talking about. You know, we're in this, everybody's in the same country. We're all faced with the same data broadly, though we can get back to that. Uh, but people see the same situation in radically different ways. And there doesn't seem to be any consensus or any space for consensus. I think understanding how we can come to different perceptual conclusions based on roughly the same data is a good way to open up space for consensus. It also opens up the way for, uh, for hacking, <laughs> for lack of a better word here, uh, because uh, both uh, the US elections and Brexit were influenced by Cambridge Analytica which used machine learning, artificial intelligence, big data sets, and uh, basically consciousness research or psychiatric profiling, whatever you want to call it, uh, in order to determine the messages that would work for different people in order to influence their perception of a set of events. So I would look at that as classical hacking, very elegantly done, not necessarily for the greatest good, but elegantly done nonetheless. Is the stuff you're working on, given that you're one of the few guys who has enough of a, a diverse thing where you're including computer science, you're including the psychology and the AI. Uh, I mean, do you think that we're going to get to the point in your lifetime where we can train someone to perceive a color differently or to perceive a, a situation very differently than they do today using tech? Well, actually, you've raised a couple of big issues there. Um going from the kind of hacking, mind hacking of Cambridge Analytica down to this very concrete idea of training somebody to see a, a, a colors differently. And actually, for that last point, we, we can already do that. Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> and yeah, you, this example of synesthesia that you, you brought up earlier, we've been interested with other of my colleagues at Sussex, Jamie Ward in particular, in synesthesia, because it's so interesting with respect to consciousness, people are having different experiences. And um, there's been a long standing question about whether you can train non synesthetes to have synesthetic experiences. You have to be able to, can you? It just seems uh, so obvious, but I could be I, wrong. I, I, I'm interested why you think it's obvious. I mean, for most people, I think they would have said it, it's not obvious that you can because uh. perception is, for most people, something that seems so closely tied to the way the world is. You know, we experience the, the way the world is as the way the world actually is. So if I told you it would be you know, easy to train yourself so that you would perceive a blue sky as green, you'd probably say, well, that doesn't make sense because the sky is blue. So it's think counterintuitive for a lot of people uh. that perception can be trained because they experience their perception as this kind of direct reflection of reality. And if it's a direct reflection of reality, well, there's no space for it to be different uh, than it is. But of course, ah. yes, you're right. We can, we can train it. We can, okay. Um, and, uh, but the previous attempts to do this had not succeeded. And the reason they hadn't succeeded is simply, well, I think, because they hadn't 
they hadn't been extensive enough. I was going to say they hadn't tried in it hard enough, but that sounds just a little <laughs> bit, bit too much of a personal criticism. I don't mean they didn't really try. Uh, it's just that within the constraints of what you can do in a lab, they uh, didn't have long enough experiments, long enough training protocols. I mean, in our first experiment, we had our volunteers come into the lab for half an hour a day, every day for five days a week for nine weeks. Yeah. And that's quite a logistical challenge for for any lab. And it kind of ate up all our resources for a long time. But turns out that's the sort of thing you need in order to get somebody who sees text just in the color that it is to start seeing a black letter K as red, let's say. That's what you need. You need to really hammer that association in. That is so incredibly cool. And Look, that's installing a a software upgrade or a superpower. Your ability to perceive the world differently than someone else uh, is pretty neat. The reason that I thought it was obvious you could do that is that um, I've spent a good amount of time doing neurofeedback to achieve advanced states of Zen mastery. I I started a company that does that uh, for executives. Four months with electrodes glued to my head. Uh, doing advanced meditation. And I just learned that my powers of self-deception are so incredibly strong that many of the things that I used to believe to be absolutely true were in fact false and based on my own biases. And by editing out my, we'll call them poorly constructed patterns, uh, I was able to see the world more clearly and be a lot less reactive to it uh, so that I was actually happier and higher performing. And based on that experience and having more than the average amount of EEG knowledge. I, I know what you can do with feedback. I also did this thing called, it was a long time ago now, like maybe eight, nine years ago, this thing called the North Paw. And for six weeks, I wore a like a tracking bracelet on my ankle that would vibrate in whichever direction was true north because I have no sense of direction. And after a while, before the solder broke, because I didn't solder it very well, uh, for a little while there, I it, it merged with my nervous system. I, I stopped noticing the vibrating. I just knew which way north was. And I know that my brain could pick that up. So those two things made me think, oh, it seems obvious, like you neuroscientists, guys with laboratories, instead of soldering irons in uh, Victoria, BC, uh, you have to have done something cooler. But I am not a synesthete. I have not trained that. I just know that you can do a little bit of plugging into the nervous system. What other cool, like what's the coolest thing you've ever taught someone to do they couldn't do in this field? Oh, I mean, that's, I th- I would have to say it's probably the synesthesia example. I mean, we, we, we're not generally doing a lot of these cognitive training okay. uh, experiments. Um, but we wanted to focus on synesthesia because it's so immediate, because it really does change your visual experience. And it also gave us something to look at in the brain. So we know, for instance, there are certain characteristics at the level of neurophysiology that distinguish natural synesthetes from non-synesthetes. One of these, for instance, is that the visual cortex is more, we like to call it, excitable. So basically, you can, you can sort of, you know, how, how ready are the neurons in your visual brain likely to fire? You know, they're just sort of buzzing around. Mm-hmm. And the way we assess that is we give a little electrical impulse to the visual cortex using something called transcranial magnetic stimulation which is a way of injecting energy. In. Love it. And then we measure the, the kind of echo, the response to that. And so what you can do is if the brain is more excitable, then you see a larger response to this perturbation, to this little pulse. Uh, and as if it, okay. Are you using, is that part of the, no, the training? Is actually This is not part of okay. the training. This is just a way to test uh, pre and post training. I mean, it's one thing to establish that, okay. yes, they're, their, their self-reported experience has changed. But then, you know, being good scientists, we want to also try and correlate those changes in self-reported experience to changes in behavior. And then also, ideally, to changes at the level of the brain. And in this study, when we trained synesthesia, um, I, so since we've talked about it a while, I want to mention it was a study really led and run by my uh, colleagues and, and postdocs in, in the lab at the time, Nick Rothen and, and Dan Bohr and David Schwartzman. Uh, what we really wanted to see was, could we observe changes in the brain as a result of these uh, these training paradigms that explain the changes in experience that people reported? And, and we were able to do that, which was quite exciting. 
I would imagine, and I know no academic would probably want to do this because it introduces more variables, but um, when I'm doing heavy duty neurofeedback training, I take everything that I know will raise nerve growth factor or BDNF, brain derived nootropic factor. For people listening who've read my uh, Headstrong book, um, you know those are compounds your brain makes that makes you more neuroplastic. But I find that during training, if you can increase those with supplements or magnetic signals or electrical signals, uh, people tend to, the, the training sticks faster. And what if you could take your nine weeks down to four weeks in order to save money in the lab? Or would that pollute it? I suppose it's possible. I mean, actually, we, we did a follow-up study uh, because, in fact, the, the nine-week study we did, we did test people midway through after four and a half weeks or five weeks, and basically most of the changes had already taken place. There. Wow. So the next study, we, we just limited to five weeks, and we got pretty much the same result so maybe you can go even lower maybe you could combine with other things it's it's lots of possibilities of course the problem is that to systematically test and control for all these possible ways of enhancing oh, yeah. and training or boosting it it's all awesome. messy yeah you're right it's, it's very very difficult to do how many hours a day were these people training oh so actually this is still to me this is the surprising thing about it even though it sounds like a lot it wasn't that much time. So they were training typically for half an hour a day. They would also have some homework to do each day. Uh, this would be something like reading a piece of text where the letters were colored in with the colors that we were trying to train. Mm. And then as the training progressed, so the important thing about the training here was that it had to be adaptive. So we we made the training harder and harder and harder as the time progressed, both to keep people's interest, uh, but also just to more deeply embed these associations. So for instance, in this reading thing, we started where people were given text with the letters just colored in. But then over the course of the training, we gradually replaced the letters with just colored blocks. Wow. So by the end of it, you know, People, I, I don't remember exactly what proportion of the letters were replaced by colored blocks. But I, if I looked at that piece of text, I wouldn't be able to read it because it was mainly just blobs of color. But the people who'd been trained by that time, you know, they'd been taken up to that level. So they now could, could read this, this text. So that all the tasks were adaptive like that. But people were typically training for half an hour a day, for five days a week, and then doing something like this reading exercise at home in the evenings. Wow. And I'm surprised because it's actually, if you think about it, you know, we're managing to overcome a whole lifetime of not receiving <laughs> letters in other colors. And the fact that we can change something uh, that quickly with, with, you know, what still seems quite effortful, but actually it's not that effortful is, is really surprising. Now, there's a couple of caveats that I really want to mention. First is... I don't, it, it's not, I mean, this is what we, we call it synesthesia-like experiences because, of course, you know, where we started, it's really impossible for me to know what your experience of the world is like. So I can't claim that the result of this training is exactly the same as somebody with synesthesia and how they would see the world. And, of course, even within synesthesia, there's a huge variety of, of vividness of experience and of other characteristics. So... We're not claiming to turn people literally into synesthetes uh, this way. So that's that's an important caveat. And we focused on colored letters because I think there's something quite open about letters uh, and reading because, of course, the brain did not evolve specific circuits for reading. Reading is a relatively recent cultural invention. Um, so whatever the parts of our brain that are involved in reading they're already expropriated from, from some other function. So the suspicion there is that the part of our brain involved in processing understanding letters is going to perhaps be more open to change than other parts of our brain. I, I feel like of the, the quarter million people who will hear this episode in the first few weeks, at least 100 of them right now are sketching out plans to train themselves to have some new ability in a half hour a day. And there will be open source software available to do this within nine months. <laughs> and there'll be a whole community of people training themselves to do all sorts of stuff. 
And and I got to say, if you're someone who decides to do that, let me know because I'll probably want to play with it because it's awesome. And if this sounds too weird, here's an example that may connect with people about this that I, I was just coming to realize as you talked about this. So I used to weigh 300 pounds. And I used to look at uh, things like, you know, French fries or, you know, junk food, basically candy bars, whatever, as food. And I would perceive them as food and I would see them and I'd salivate and I'd get hungry and I'd have cravings. And after a few years of eating in a way that made me feel really good, I stopped perceiving them as actual food items. And someone said, oh, you know, just turn at the street past whatever the fast food restaurant was. And I was, I had no idea where the fast food restaurant was. And I said, what do you mean you drive past that place every day? I said, yeah, but I don't see it because it has no utility in my life. Like I, I, you wouldn't go there to eat. They don't have food. There's nothing of value there. And so I literally had to go to Google to figure out where the local fast food joint was uh, because I just didn't perceive it ever. It was not in my memory. And certainly if I tried to perceive it, I could. But I, I do know that my perception of the things that I would look for in the environment around me has shifted dramatically. Something happened in my brain there. So if that's happened in your brain, it's not that big of a stretch to think that what Anil's talking about here is possible. And plus, they showed in the lab it's possible. That example is really helpful, actually, because it brings up something that I wanted to mention earlier when we were talking about we touched on Cambridge Analytica and, and uh, yeah the way we perceive uh, differences in society, which is that we, we don't, as humans, we don't just passively experience a stream of sensory information. We're always actively sampling our, our worlds. You know, we're, we're deciding where to look. We're deciding what to pay attention to within our visual field. And of course, if we're looking for news online, you know, we, we choose the media sources that we, that we, find out about the world from. Um, in perception, in neuroscience, we call this sort of active perception, active inference, active sampling, this idea that we're not just passive recipients of a waterfall of sensory information. And this is a major driver in how we can come to perceive things differently, whether it's ourselves through training or whether it's how different people can perceive the same thing differently. Because even if it's the same objective world, Yes, they can have exactly the same sensory data and come to different perceptual conclusions about it. But also, on top of that, they're not going to be sampling the same world in the same way. They're going to be sampling different parts of it. And as they do that, you can build up these kind of reinforcing circles that, that entrench different kinds of perceptions and different kinds of beliefs. So in the US, it's no surprise that somebody who watches Fox News is going to have certain political viewpoints reinforced as compared to someone who watches CNN, can have other kinds of political beliefs reinforced. Same thing with Brexit over here. But same thing just as we walk around the world. Your example now is, is beautiful about fast food restaurants. You, They're not useful to you, so you don't perceive them and you, you don't even really look for them. So when, you know, when you're doing this filtering step of perception, you're not directing your eyes or your attention to these aspects of the world that would be available were you to focus on them. So you're sampling the world differently. And then you construct a different kind of perception of you know, the food related, you know, through the food lens of, of, of your world is now different from your previous food lens of the world where these fast food restaurants were highly salient entities. It, it really, it really is, is kind of blowing my mind here, just thinking about what could I consciously train myself uh, to perceive that would be most, uh, most useful uh, in order to just make me a more effective human being. If you had the ability to train your brain to see something you don't see today or to see something differently, what would you pick? That's a very good question. I, I think... I would probably pick perceiving my own internal state, which might sound a bit of an obtuse answer, but yeah. this, is, this, this is, I think... Oh, that's a great answer. Tell, tell me more. <laughs> it goes back to this idea that, that I mentioned at the, the top of this, uh, this interview, that the experience of being a self, the experience of being me rather than you, if anybody has the experience of being somebody, that's a perception. That's not the kind of recipient of perceptions. Uh, 
you know, the self, the way I experience being an ill Seth is a perceptual construction. I perceive my body as a particular object in the world with a configuration, a color, a size, a shape. Um, I perceive it as mine and as different from objects that I might hold. You know, I perceive myself as an identity over time with a particular set of memories. When I make an action, I perceive it as a voluntary action. And of course, perhaps more fundamentally, when I experience emotions, they're also perceptions of bodily states or of changes in our physiology. And this is a very old tradition in psychology that goes back to William James in the 19th century and even earlier. But they they come out in modern neuroscience in the same way that we begin to think about perception of the outside world. Emotion is an inference, a best guess about what's going on inside the body. And the purpose of perceiving the body is not always to get an accurate picture of what it's like. I mean, I don't really care what my blood pressure is numerically. I just want to make sure that I'm going to stay alive. So emotions, I think, reflect a perception of how well the body is doing at regulating its physiology in a way that, that's adaptive and that, that's useful. And when that goes wrong, that's when a lot of you know, anxiety, depression, uh, other perhaps aversive states but that can shade into psychiatric illness, the extremes, come into play. So if I could train myself to perceive uh, not necessarily more accurately, but if I could train my perception in a way that's useful, I would. I think training my perception of the body would be best. And of course, that's what a lot of meditation, in fact, is is about. Uh, one of the things that really blew my mind on my path, in addition to neurofeedback, which trains you to perceive some things in the brain, uh, before I got as heavily into that as I am, I started doing heart rate variability feedback training. So I could learn to perceive the state of my fight or flight arousal. And I had no idea that I had it pretty much pegged all the way into fight or flight all the time. <laughs> but uh, learning how to how to perceive a shift from one state to another that was invisible to me uh, was mm. it blew my mind. And it really made me more aware of what the world around me was doing to my body. And you could say that is my perception. My body was perceiving it as a threat, even though it's just the world. Yeah. When I was able to notice the shifts and then make changes. Uh, and so that, that though is a straight up bodily awareness function that's relatively easy to train. Um, is that something you play with in the lab, the heart rate variability stuff? We look at it, certainly. Um, we have not done too much in the way of, of training of heart rate variability per se. I, have, uh, I work very closely with colleagues at the medical school here, um, Hugo Critchley, Sarah Garfinkel, who's done a lot of work over the years looking at how well people can perceive heartbeats. Now, heartbeats are one very, very salient signature of, of internal physiology. And we differ in how well we can perceive our heartbeats, both between individuals and within individuals across time. And heartbeat detection does seem to be something you can train, although we have to be very careful about whether we're training that ability specifically or just training people to be generally good at a perceptual task which involves time. I mean, that's, there's always these, these worries about specificity and potential confound. One thing you said, which I think is, is, is really important, is, is just this emphasis on feedback. And one of the lessons that you've obviously learned in your own journey, and one of the lessons that's very, very prominent in neuroscience is how powerful feedback really is. And the brain, in some sense, is a machine that's for prediction, and it tunes its predictions based on feedback. We can think of sensory signals as not just telling us the way the world is, but as providing feedback based on our current best guess about what's out there. And any time you can give the brain a feedback signal to work with, it seems to be very become much more possible to train uh, ourselves to control the source of that signal, whether it's heartbeat variability, whether it's the firing of an individual neuron even, you know, that can be trained through feedback. It, it's actually frightening. Uh, one of the reasons that I, when I did, when I opened the 40 years is in uh, neuroscience uh, thing that I do, uh, one of the big reasons I wanted a neuroscientist I could work with on my own brain, but I bought clinical grade gear uh, to use at home uh, many years ago. 
And I learned pretty quickly from just reading the papers and all, you can take a perfectly healthy brain, give it a bad neurofeedback signal, and you can turn on PTSD in someone who doesn't have PTSD. Like you can really mess up someone's brain with bad neurofeedback because you can train neurons to fire that have no business firing in a certain pattern. And you can sort of scramble things. And I realized that... Yeah, that, that, uh, that's why we have ethics. Uh, well, exactly. <laughs> University to, but, to prevent people from doing stuff like this. Uh, exactly. It, and so I realized pretty soon that doing brain surgery on yourself was maybe not a good idea. And you might want to work with a professional, uh, which is the risk of you know, being a, a hacker of yourself in that, you know, if, if you don't have adequate safety things in your own protocols, you could hurt yourself. Then again, if you have a skateboard ramp, you could also hurt yourself. So... Uh, you know, there are risks in everything we do, and I'm not sure the risks are particularly higher in this kind of stuff than they are in a lot of common activities that, that people uh, people do on a daily basis. But it's still the power of feedback. If you can take a healthy brain in two hours of bad feedback and make someone less than they were before, less capable or less aware or less whatever else, um, what you're dealing with is a tool of great power that could be used for good or bad. And I, I love it the way you guys are really getting into uh, feedback and uh, and just this kind of training. It It's opening perceptions for me. You talk about something called deep dreaming. Can you talk about what that is for you? Sure. Deep dreaming is actually, it's, a, it's an algorithm that the folks at Google invented a few years ago that we've been using in a different context. The best way to explain it is that... Um, there are now plenty of machine learning algorithms that are very, very good at classifying images. You know, they can take any number, they've been trained on millions or tens of millions of photos that have been uploaded to the Google database in the sky. And with that huge data set and these neural networks, so-called deep convolutional neural networks, which are basically just lots of layers of artificial neurons, um, these can be trained to classify images. Is there a dog there or not a dog? What kind of dog? And so on. Um, and have the performance of these algorithms is now extremely good, human level or superhuman level in some instances. But what was difficult to know is what's actually going on within these networks while they're doing this. And so what the people at Google decided to do was basically run the backwards, take a network that's working fix it at the top level, basically tell the network there is a dog there, then run the network backwards and have it update the image bit by bit until it settles into a set steady state where what the image is and what you're telling the network is there all, all match up. And you can then look at, the, at what happens. And this is when you start to see really strange things. So there's a lot of these images flowed around the internet at the time with bowls of pasta suddenly sprouting dog heads and um, <laughs> just weird stuff happening and what looked like, uh, to be honest, quite a psychedelic eruption of imagery uh, through this Google Deep Dream algorithm. And what we got interested in was the extent to which we could consider this as an interesting model of unusual perceptual states because the deep networks that were in that, uh, that underlie this process are you can think of them as very simplified models of how the brain does vision it's a bunch of neurons and information goes from one end to the other so we used uh, the deep dream algorithm and instead of just taking a single photo though what we did was we took a panoramic video uh, and then we subject we put each frame of the video through this process and did some continuity and whatnot so that when you put a virtual reality headset on you can look around the scene and you perceive it uh through this deep dream process so suddenly what was just as if you were in the middle of our university campus looking around and seeing people grabbing their lunch suddenly the scene has changed and it's as if there are dogs coming out of everywhere. And the reason this is interesting is because I think it, it gives us a way of understanding this balance between uh, sensory data coming in and our prior expectations going the other way that through their interaction form what we perceive. 
And yeah, another good example of this is when we look up a, uh, a cloudy sky, lots of little white fluffy clouds, we can sometimes see faces in these clouds. As you said earlier, the brain is extraordinarily good at pattern recognition. One of the patterns it's especially good at recognizing is faces. If you follow that, I think the Twitter thread faces and things, this is brilliant, right? We see faces in pretty much anything because the brain is always projecting this, if you like, a face template onto onto whatever sensory signals are, are coming in. And you can understand hallucination and you can understand maybe psychedelic perception. You can understand this deep dream thing as just turning the dial so that these patterns for faces or dogs or whatever just become stronger. So we start to impose these patterns on things that we wouldn't normally do. And for me, that's a, a really good lesson into how perception works all the time and also how it works in unusual circumstances like hallucination, like psychedelia. You, you work in the field of, of psychiatry as well. And I kind of think that if I wore virtual reality goggles for a week nonstop that were running the deep dreaming algorithms, you'd be flirting with madness. I mean, you, you'd see all this stuff around you that isn't there. Uh, you, you'd be able to function. And I look at some of, of, you know, the most impressive and interesting art out there where there's all sorts of images embedded in things. And, and you look at it and you're like, what was going on? And then you find out that the artist was uh, pretty much deranged <laughs> on some level or another. Uh, what happens when people put on these VR goggles, uh, seeing the world through one of these AI filters? The, the honest answer is we don't know. I mean, there's there's always a worry about the long term. I mean, we don't we know like over over ten minutes, not a lot, right? We don't tend to do these things for for very long. Not much, yeah. Mostly yeah. because um, we don't need to do it for for more than ten minutes to get some idea of of how they're perceiving things. Also, just in VR, people tend to feel a little bit nauseous if they're wearing goggles for for far too long. Just technical things like that. But the bigger question is, indeed. Uh, if people are manipulating the way they perceive things systematically and for extended periods of time, you know, what happens? And we were talking earlier about this cognitive training paradigm, but even there, that's just like isolated episodes of half an hour a day when people are doing particular tasks. We're not changing the way they perceive everything throughout their whole waking uh, life. And that's something that that uh, isn't done very often. You, you mentioned uh, you were wearing this magnet or something like a magnet that was giving you a sense of north. And it, it was a it was a vibrating cell phone motor. It was just vibrate whichever way it was north. I yeah. mean that that that's fantastic. I remember I heard that Oliver Sacks used to do something similar. I don't know if you heard this. That apparently he used to walk around with a bunch of magnets in his pockets that were so arranged oh, wow. that they would line up and always give him a sense of where north was. Um, Interesting. <laughs> he used to just walk around New York with these magnets in his pockets. I quite like quite <laughs> like that that idea and there's this you know there's a wonderful tradition actually of of individual people just doing stuff like this i mean some of these early 20th century psychologists um there's a guy whose name i can't remember off the top of my head but who's very interested in perceptual adaptation so he'd wear these goggles these inverting goggles basically like a, yes. a 45 degree mirror and uh you know you put those on and then the world flips upside down and you can no longer do anything. You know, you try and pick up a cup of tea and you pour it all over yourself because you automatically adjust to your perception. And of course, your perception is now inverted. The idea is if you wear them long enough, your perception will um, will invert and become the right way up and you'll be able to behave normally. And there's wonderful videos from like the 1940s, I think, of people... Uh, doing ridiculous things like skiing and fencing, uh, wearing these inverting goggles um, and wow. sort of managing to do it. But they have the before and after videos. And these are the before videos are some of the funniest things I've ever seen, I think. It's like <laughs> somebody tries to stab somebody with a, in a fencing thing and the other, the other guy just lifts his arm completely out of the way uh, because that's what <laughs> you would do if you see things upside down. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of questions to be asked, actually, about what the long-term um, implications are of changing the way you might perceive the world. I think one of the lessons from these earlier studies was that uh, 
if you, for instance, you wore these inverting goggles for a while, after a few days or after a couple of weeks, I don't know how long it took, people would be able to function and would perceive the world the right way up again. But then you take the goggles off and suddenly now they couldn't function. Um, Right. I think it was a couple of weeks, if I remember right, because this is one of those things. If you don't think your brain is neuroplastic and you read about these studies, it has to be. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. It is. But what, what was interesting there was the recovery period was much shorter than the initial training period. So it might have taken a couple of weeks to train people to perceive things the right way up when they're wearing the goggles. But when they took the goggles off, it didn't take two weeks for them to recover you know to restore to their normal pre-goggle situation so there is a lot of plasticity but there's this i think there's a if you like there's a tendency to for the brain to return to old entrenched patterns once you take the training away i want to get your neuroscience take on a couple different perception exercises uh, um, that i that just stand out in my own self-experiments uh, one time a while ago, I was at a yoga retreat at uh, Yosemite National Park. And I'm standing on a stone uh, near the edge of a cliff and doing a one-legged standing pose. Now, normally, when you're going to stand, you lose your balance, so you pick a fixed point in front of you on the floor about five feet away. But for me, the nearest fixed point was a half a mile away, and it was half dome. <laughs> and I felt this really weird experience where all of a sudden my perception of reality around me got really big because my fixed point was no longer in my local area. In fact, it inspired me so much. I have a 28 foot tall tree that we topped uh, in my backyard with a ladder going up it. So I can stand on the top of the tree on one leg wearing a climbing harness so I won't die uh, in case I fall uh, and look out at you know, the island across the way, and I can stand on one leg, and my perception of the world is so different than it normally would be if I didn't do this every now and then. What is going on with that? Wow, that is a good question. I Yeah, I, that's very interesting because it's um, it speaks to a couple of things, I think, of the neuroscience perception. One is this idea of perception not as a way of discovering what's out there, but as a means of control. So when you're using a fixed point to retain balance, you're not using, you're not perceiving half dome in the distance or whatever fixed point you're looking at to try to understand what it is or see what it is. You're using it as a way to control your posture. You, your, your perceptual system is now working as a kind of thermostat for balance, a homeostat, right? There's a fixed point and you, you want to prevent deviations from that fixed point. And if you prevent deviations from that fixed point, that means you'll still be standing up. And that's that's what you want to do. There's a beautiful and actually quite neglected theory in perception called perceptual control theory. And this is exactly the idea that uh, behavior is in the service of perception rather than the other way around. Because again, we, we're so conditioned to think of perception as like there's a world out there and we perceive it as it is, or maybe we, 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 we systematically misperceive it in some way because we know about visual illusions and all that, but it would be great if we could perceive the world more accurately as it is. And once we've got that perception, then we can decide what to do and we execute actions and we you know, move our bodies. And I think this is almost entirely wrong. Right? I mean, we okay. don't, <laughs> you know, the purpose of perception is not to figure out objectively what's out there in the world. The purpose of perception is to enable our adaptive behavior. And so we don't so die. So we don't die. And in the in, the, in, in the, the most extreme version of that, the purpose of perception is to keep the body alive, you know, to keep my heart going, yeah. to keep my blood pressure within bounds. And you know, this is a theory I've written about in my work called the I like to call it the beast machine theory, the way of, of saying the way we perceive everything, whether it's out there in the world or in here in the body can only be properly understood event because of its uh, utility in keeping us alive. You know, we perceive the world with, through, and because of our physiological bodies. The bodies aren't just 
vehicles for moving our brain from meeting to meeting. We can only understand perception through this imperative to, of staying alive. But just in your example, it, it really highlights that perception in that case is about regulating a variable. And that when you perceive the same situation from the perspective of regulating something rather than discovering what it is, your experience is going to be very different. And we know perception works like this in many cases. One of the, the classic experiment is how people catch a ball, whether it's baseball in the States or cricket in, in, in England, in the UK. Um, if you ask a cricketer what they're doing when they run to make a catch, if you ask anyone what they do when they run to make a catch, let's say the ball's sailing overhead, then most people would probably say something like, oh, yeah, I, I, I look up and I figure out where the ball is and where it's going to land and, and I kind of run to where it's going to land so that I can catch the ball. But that's not what people are doing. You know, what people are doing is they're running so as to minimize how the angle of the ball to the horizon changes. Now, there's, a, there's a very specific equation you can write down. They're minimizing, I think it's the acceleration of the tangent of the ball. To, it doesn't really matter, but there's a very simple perceptual variable that they're trying to regulate to maintain constant. And you can just prove it mathematically quite easily that if people move so as to control that perceptual variable, the ball will just end up hitting them squarely between the eyes. So if people do that, <laughs> they will intercept the ball. I mean, they're not, obviously the ball doesn't hit. You know, they have to at some point switch to catching the damn thing. Um, but <laughs> you can make predictions about how people will move if they're following this strategy compared to figuring out where the ball is going to land and running there as fast as they can. And wow. so it turns out that people are following this control strategy, but they don't know that that's what they're doing. So there's a lot of layers of perception that are in the story we tell ourselves. All right, here's another another question for you. Uh, this goes back. Uh, so I put on a conference on on biohacking uh, every year. We just finished the sixth annual one, and at at least four of those years, I, I put on an experiment. I didn't do it this year. I just didn't have time for it. Where we allow people to strap on a pair of virtual reality goggles, and then we have a camera mounted up behind them. So they're able to play themselves like a video game. So they can see their body from up, from above and behind them. And then their job is just to walk through a simple obstacle course on the ground, you know, touch the red thing, touch the orange thing. And it blows people's minds. Like all of a sudden your consciousness is outside of your body. And it's, uh, it, it's actually kind of a, an emotional experience, uh, for lack of a better word. And I said this up, I've had my kids do it in the driveway and, uh, and I've certainly done it. And it's, it, it's a, just a, kind of a liberating thing where you just realize maybe I'm not that neat. What is your uh, neuroscience uh, perception expert take on what that's doing to our brains? Oh, that, that's a great um, exercise. Great experience, actually. We, we've done very similar things in, oh, in cool. the lab here, and, and we do public uh, science events quite frequently, and we set up virtual reality things, much like that. Oh, neat. And, yeah, I, I love it because for, for a number of reasons. The first is that I think the most fundamental thing I take from, from these kinds of setups is again, it deconstructs our assumption about what the self is. I and mean, we tend to assume that part of what it is to be me is that the first person perspective, that my first person perspective is located somewhere inside my head, probably, you know, maybe in my forehead, a little bit behind my forehead, but somewhere in there. And that's just like, taken for granted. That's where my mm -hmm. first person perspective is. And then when you hear of people reporting things like out-of-body experiences, it's tempting to dismiss it a little bit and say, no, like, you know, the soul, being a good materialist and thinking that souls aren't these things that float around in a Cartesian immaterial heaven, um, that, nah, you know, your soul doesn't leave your body and go flying around. And what a demonstration like this does is it shows that Actually, you can very well have the experience of a first-person perspective that is not located where your body is. And that doesn't mean that your soul has left your body. It just means that a first-person perspective 
is another kind of perception. It's another perceptual inference. Like in your case, you generate these out of body like experiences because you're giving people literally a different perspective. They see themselves from an external perspective. So from the brain's point of view, the best explanation for that kind of video input is that the first person perspective has shifted to somewhere else. I mean, it's, it's what makes best sense of the data. And so it, it selectively modulates one part of what it is to be a self. And we realize through doing this that aspects of the way we experience ourselves in the world that we previously took for granted, we shouldn't take for granted. And it also helps us understand phenomena in neurology because there are, uh, it's not just these very vivid and occasional out of body experiences that, that, that we've heard about in, in spiritual and religious contexts or in operating theaters and so on. Uh, people have, there's a whole variety of these, what we call full body illusions. Um, so there's the closest I think that these virtual reality manipulations get us to is something that we call autoscopic phenomena. So an autoscopic phenomena is something where you see yourself from a different perspective but you still feel yourself to be where your body really is to some extent. There's a dissociation from, it's not a full-blown out-of-body experience where everything about you has shifted somewhere else. Then there's heotoscopic experiences with an H in front of it, which is where people, these are also called doppelganger experiences, where people can perceive another version of themselves and their self-location may oscillate from one body to the other and apparently a uh, I think Dostoevsky used to suffer from, from this condition, um, or some famous author did. So we can start to get a handle on some of these, what are on the face of it, very peculiar conditions where people report really weird disturbances of how they experience their selfhood. And we can come up with quite natural explanations for them. That is, uh, that is amazing. I'm, I'm blown away at just all the the stuff that's going to be coming our way over the next 10 years because of the work you're doing uh, and the work uh, many others are doing around our perception of reality. And I think we're going to become better at understanding when we're seeing an accurate representation and when we're seeing one that is uh, highly colored by our own experiences in the past. And it feels like the better we do that, the, the better off we'll be as people. I think the key is that, we, my hope is that we might actually move away from this idea, this ideal of accuracy, um, mm. because it really, it really relies on this assumption that there is a single way the world is, and that we need to calibrate our perception to fully, objectively, accurately reflect that. But just to go back to where we started with the simple example of color, you know, color is not out there in the world, color is already a construction of, of, the, of the brain. So I think we, we need to develop ways of training our perception, not necessarily so that it's the most accurate, but so that it's the most useful for us as individuals and for us as collections of individuals within a society of diverse people who will see the world in different ways. Very well said. Anil, I have another question for you that is going to touch on consciousness uh, for sure. And I've been asking people in, in Game Changers, my, my last book was based on this, you know, almost 500 uh, people, advice for performing better as a human being. Uh, one of those big pieces of advice was, was get outside yourself. People who perform well found some way, whether it's meditation or hallucinogens or some practice to get a better perception of themselves. So... I've changed my question because my next book is around anti-aging and my quest to live to at least 180. And uh, you may look at that and go, what the hell are you talking about? D different thing, but I, I believe that that is probably achievable. So someone's got to do it. Um, I'll sign up. Uh, it's okay if I die trying. Now, my question for you is, how long do you want to live? It's a very good question. It varies. In all honesty, <laughs> it, 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 my answer might not be the same uh, every day. I, one, I, I'll answer it indirectly with a, with a short 
story of a, of a personal experience or a personal lack of experience. You know, of course, this fear of mortality or just the conception of mortality that is so difficult to face or grasp. The the idea of not existing is so counter to everything that our brain does. I mean, all our perceptions are geared towards the continuity of our of both our physiological and our psychological identity. And I think that's why it's so difficult to face up to the realization that ultimately, whether it's after 80 years or 180 years or 180,000 years, that's not, you know, that's going to come to an end. And so I've nothing against sort of life extension apart from its possible inequitable distribution among yeah. society. That's definitely a, an issue. But these age anti-aging technologies, that's a different conversation. Um, but in thinking and reflecting on this personally, I'm drawn to a couple of things. One is that I think we overestimate our continuity and identity as an individual anyway. So I've, I've used this term in some of my work called self-change blindness. So we know from many experiments in psychology that if things change slowly, we tend not to perceive them as changing at all. Right. We're kind of blind, perceptually and cognitively blind to things that change very slowly. It explains why we're, you know, we're not perceiving the effects of climate change so much. Things are changing more slowly, so we perceive them as not changing at all. And I think this applies to the self as well, and actually more than it applies to the world. And that's because perception of the self is really geared towards keeping it the same. In the same way that we wanted to keep the angle of the cricket ball the same to catch it, I want to keep my blood pressure the same. I want to keep my heart rate variability the same, because that's consistent with me staying alive. So I'm going to perceptually overestimate how continuous I am. I know that I'm not the same person I was when I was 10 years old. I'm unlikely to be the same person when I'm 76 as I am in my mid 40s now. But it's so in a sense, there's less to hang on to. Right? What does it mean to extend my uh, life to whatever arbitrary horizon? Because I won't be the same person then anyway. Um, so that's one one thing. And I think you can come to this recognition through meditation, through other kinds of, as you say, various ways of getting outside yourself. You can start to realize this. And the other reflection was my experiences of general anesthesia. And you know, I've had a few operations uh, over my life and they've all gone well, thankfully. And in the last, and each time I've got more interested in just the experience of losing consciousness under anesthesia and regaining it on the other side. And there's something about anesthesia, which for me I find extremely reassuring about the prospects of non-existence, because it's really oblivion. It's not like going to sleep at all. If, 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 I, I don't yeah. know, Dave, have you, had, have you had general anesthesia? I've had general anesthesia as well as I just did ketamine on, uh, on video recently. <laughs> <laughs> but I, see, I think that's probably a big difference there because there is, whether yeah. you're asleep and yeah, I mean, ketamine is used as an anesthetic, but it's, it, but it's kind it's of an general. extreme dissociation. It's Correct. not the complete oblivion of something like propofol or midazolam or some of the classic general anesthetics that you would, you, you would get in operating theaters um, in the West or everywhere really. Um, and when you go into general anesthesia, there is nothing. You know, you yeah. could have been under for five minutes, five hours, or 500 years. It doesn't matter. You are not there. And I find this sort of existentially reassuring because when you're gone, you're gone, and there is nothing. And uh, it, this is a, there's a book title by one of my favorite authors, Julian Barnes, and the book title is called Nothing to be Frightened of. <laughs> And I think the double meaning of that title when it comes to mortality is exactly right. There really is nothing to be frightened of. Of course, it doesn't always feel that way at the time. That is uh, very eloquently put. And uh, yeah, if there's nothing to be frightened of, then you got nothing to be frightened of. 
And if there's something else that you have no provable ability to do, you have no control over it anyway. So there's still nothing to be afraid of. <laughs> so either way, like you've, you've got nothing to lose, whatever, whatever your belief well, system is. It's not necessary. It's also, just let me be clear. It's not, it's not, I'm not saying this is a desirable condition to be in. You know, I think yeah. life is better. <laughs> yeah, me too. I, I'm keen to be alive, but I'm also aware that, that uh, you know, the value of life is, is to do with the emotion is the emotional states you experience while alive driven and, by perception right <laughs> and and those can be aversive or positive and then of course there's the value of life and the meaning of your life for others and so on but the fear of mortality i think is something that that can be addressed and that neuroscience does have something specific to say about wonderful answer I really appreciate your body of work, Anil. I think you're doing some stuff that is fundamental to cracking the code for what really makes us tick and what really makes us a human at our at our core and how we interact with each other and the world around us. And thanks to you and your, your colleagues for doing that work. Um, your body of work is uh, probably best accessed via your Twitter feed, I would say. Anil K. Seth, A-N-I-L-K-S-E-T-H on Twitter. And I think you have a website as well, but I'm not remembering the URL. What's your, what's your website? It's simply anilseth.com. Uh, anilseth.com. Well, keep on hacking human brains. When you have a really cool perception experiment that I can do at home, uh, give me a call. I'm totally game. I'll be happy to. Thanks a lot. It's been great chatting to you. If you like today's episode, you know what to do. Change someone else's perception of reality by heading over to Amazon and leaving a review for one of my books, <laughs> like Game Changers. Because believe it or not, you can change someone's perception of reality by saying, hey, I like this, or conversely, I don't like this. Uh, whichever one you choose, uh, people do look at um, what, what the crowd does, and it changes their behavior, it changes their perception. So if you think this show is worth your time, leave a review for the show. If you think reading a book based on the show is worth your time, do that. And as always, enjoy your Bulletproof Coffee. Have an awesome day. I'll see you in a couple days. 